But we're going to continue with our series, The Fruitful Life. We kicked it off on last week, and we said this, that there is no fruit without a good root. Where there is no root, there can be no fruit. If the soil is not good, the root system cannot produce good fruit. Now, for those of you who may be wine connoisseurs, I'm not endorsing drinking. I'm just, you know, I just study different things. And this is what I know about different wines. The reason why people want to taste some wine from Italy or wine from France or some from Napa Valley in California and some from the good old uh, country of Texas. <laughs> the reason why they do it is because there's different soil types and the different soils kind of puts its own flavor in the grape, which then is manifest in the wine that is produced. And so if the soil is good in our own lives and, uh, and uh, the, the soil is good and the root system is strong, then we can produce great fruit. The Christian with shallow roots and a poor soil condition will not bear fruit, will not bear fruit. And then the primary crux of what we talked about on last week was this. The Holy Spirit makes the fruitful life possible. Why? Because it's his fruit, not ours. It doesn't say the fruit of Ricky Tejada is love, peace, and joy. It says the fruit of the Spirit is. So what we talk about, we talked about last week that you have to yield you have to submit yourself under the control of the Holy Spirit in order for his fruit to manifest and develop and grow in our lives. Now, the foundation of the fruitful life, we find it in the book of Galatians. Paul writes this in the fifth chapter, verse 16. He says this, I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Everybody say this, walk in the spirit. That's the key to the fruitful life, walking in the spirit. And he says, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh if you'll walk in the spirit. We have to know this, that we are in a war. And as Pastor Stephen said on last week in his delivery of the message, he said this, the, the war you will not win is the one that you're not even aware of exists. We are in a battle, and from one week to the next, from one day to the next, we have this thing that's going on because we've, brought, we've invited Christ into our heart. Scripture says that we've been made new creatures, but we still live in this thing called the flesh, in the body. Now, why does the body fight against the spirit? Because it's temporary. Your physical body is not going to go with you into eternity. And so what it's trying to do is make the most of everything. It's like eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. That's what the body's saying. Like, you know, I'm going to have my fun right now. And the spirit's saying, no, you have to think and you've got to play the long game. There's an eternity at stake here. So there's a conflict and it's daily. And what we have to do in order to win in that conflict is yield control of our life to the Holy Spirit. Everybody say yield. yield. We talked about this on last week. How do we know when the Holy Spirit is in control of our lives? We find that in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22 through 24. And we read, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such there is no law and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit everybody say walk in the spirit, walk in the spirit. this is how we win the battle we walk in the spirit so let us pray Father, we come to you now and we thank you, Lord, for your great word, your great work of grace in our lives. Oh, Lord, we need you. We declare our love for you, our allegiance to you. And, Father, if we're going to have and live a fruitful life, we recognize that we have to connect with you. We have to yield to you. And, Father, that's what we do right now. We yield to you. Our heart, our mind, our will thoughts, we give them to you now. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would just do a work in us today. Let the fruit of the Spirit manifest in our lives, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. We're going to look at those three today. And the first one we're going to look at is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, when we talk about love from an English uh, uh, standpoint, we have one word for love. And so we could say this, I love Bluebell and Magic Shell. <laughs> we could say this, I love my pet. Or I love my job. Or I love my spouse. Or I love my kids. Or I love going on vacation. See, we have one word for all of those, and everybody in the world knows that I don't love Blue Bell and Magic Shell more than I love Sid. <laughs> Sometimes she might question that. No, no, she doesn't. No, no, no. I love my girl. I love her with my whole heart. But we use that same word, and, and really it doesn't have the same context and the same meaning. So in the Greek, though, there are four words for that word love. We're going to look at those, not expound upon them with the exception of one. So one of the words for love in the Greek is phileo. Phileo means this. It's a love that you would have for a friend. We talk about, uh, about the, the people that we hang with, that, that we have an affection for them because they are our friend. We might do life together, we hang together, we have some common interests together, and, and we get along relatively good. So they're friends. That's phileo love. And then there's storge. Storge love, it's a love that you have for a family member. We see in the scripture this combination of this phileo and this storge. We see that in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 12. So storge is a love for a family member. Phileo is just a love for a friend. And Paul writes this in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse uh, 10. He says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. That word love right there is a combination of the word phileo and storge. And, and then he goes on to say this, an honor giving preference to one another. So what's the significance there? The significance is, is that anybody can function in storge or in phileo, and when you pull them together, it would be this. You know why we have love for one another? Because we hang together, so we're friends, but there's another connection. What's the family connection? Just like Sid is related to me because of marriage, and Seth and Caleb are our sons because of our marriage and our blood in them, what makes family family? Blood. So what makes us a family? It's the blood of Christ. That that's what we have in common. And this is why we can connect with one another. And that we can love one another. And we can relate to one another. And even when we really go deep in, in, in God and we're all out, sometimes the family relationship that you have in your church is greater than the family bond that you have with your own blood relatives. I remember for a season when I came to Christ. Because I was so all in with Christ, man, my family did not like me. Now, some of that was my own fault, too, because it might have something to do with me telling them every day they were going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> then I got smart and said, just shut up. Though I didn't get smart. The Lord just told me, shut your mouth. Is what he told me. Just be quiet. Don't you say a word. Just live it and let them watch you. And if they ask a question, then you can speak. 18 months later, they had all come to Christ yeah. in a deeper understanding of who he was. So there's phileo, there's storge, and then there's eros, third Greek word for love, and that's the sexual love. It's a, it carries this connotation uh, of uh, aggression that is in it for self. It's a, self, a selfish, self-serving passion. And here's the reality is that the world functions in, in all three of those, in the, the friendship kind of love, in the brother or familiar family love, or in the eros. And the reality is, is that most of the world's functioning in eros. See that fine mama going down the street, and you're like, I love her, I want to get to know her, or something to that effect. You see that hunk of a man, man he looks like the rock, so, you know, hey, and so because we operate from the fleshly standpoint, the, we go by what we see first. But there's a fourth 
A fourth love, or a fourth word for love in the Greek, and it's agape. Agape. And we see this expressed in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 5. Listen to what the scripture says. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Agape. Now, here's the reality. Here's what you need to completely understand. This kind of love. Agape love cannot be manufactured by us in any way. And most of the world does not function in agape at all. They might function in eros, they might uh, function in storge, they might uh, function in phileo, but they will not agape. Why? Because the only way you can function in agape is by yielding, to uh, submitting yourself to the Holy Spirit. It's the only way. So what is agape? Agape is God's own love, which is manifested in Christ. And this love that God has for us, manifested through him, giving his son, floods our lives and springs in us a response to that love. That then causes us to relate to God, relate to, uh, to Jesus Christ, and to one another in an unconditional way. Everybody say unconditional. That's what agape is. It is unconditional love. It is love that is given, love that is offered, love that is expressed without condition. No strings attached. I'm doing for you simply because I've made a decision to. See, if you've ever questioned God's love, you just need to stop questioning that. Why? Because God's love is not based in feeling like phileo or storge or storge or or eros, God's love is based in a decision because of who he is. No strings attached. A good example of a manifestation of this love besides Christ dying for us would be a mom. A mom's body changes when she has babies. And that baby, as sure as my name is Ricky Tejada, at some point in time, that baby is going to pee on her and going to use the do number two on her and is going to sap her energy and make a demand on her time when she's tired. But guess what? Mama's going to serve that child. And you better not get in her way either. Don't mess with my baby. How many of y'all are like 60 years old and your mama still call you her baby? <laughs> it's just the way it is. The rest of your life, you're her baby. Because they have this unconditional love. So here's the question that we have. So the focus that we have when we talk about love is not on uh, phileo, storge, or on uh, eros. It is on agape. Because this is the love that the fruit that the spirit bears. This is the fruit that the spirit bears. So why do we need the spirit bearing the fruit of love in our lives? Why? One word, people. We need the agape love because we have to deal with people. Stupid people, <laughs> flawed people, jerk kind of people, knuckleheaded people, selfish people, needy people, Hateful people, crazy people. <laughs> Shall I go on? <laughs> and somewhere in that list, we are all contained. Nobody's excluded from that list at all. Why do we need the love of God manifesting the fruit of love in our lives? Why do we need the Holy Spirit doing that? Because we have to deal with people. It's not easy to deal with people. Racism in our nation that is heightened. You know there's a, like a warfare going on between race and gender and class. Those are basically the three things where there's division in our society. And none of them are going to be solved by eros, phileo, storge. They're going to be satisfied and resolved by agape. The only way. But guess what? We don't have the ability within ourselves to produce agape, except that we yield to the Spirit. Everybody say yield. yield. 
I, I like watching, you know, the, the committees and stuff in Washington and their discourse. And they'll be, they'll have their time on the floor and they'll be talking and doing their deal. And when they're finished with their statements and their comments, then they'll say to the chairman, I yield back to you. You've seen them do that? I yield back to you. What they're saying is, is that I'm now putting this back in your control. I'm giving you the opportunity. I'm stepping off the scene. It's not my moment. It's not my time. And that's where we have to come in, in the life that we have of dealing with people. We have to say to the Holy Spirit, they're stupid, they're crazy, they're ignorant, they are hard to get along with, and they're getting on my last nerve, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm yielding to you. I'm yielding to you so that you can begin within me to produce this fruit of love, this unconditional love, that even though they call me a name, even though they develop a system that might work against me, even though they might uh, uh, try to uh, do harm to me, my response to them is love, unconditional love. Now, let me ask you this question. Are you walking in unconditional love? The things you watch on TV, conversations that you see happening on social media, stuff that you experience every day, that's not good. But are you yielding to the Spirit? Are you yielding in such a way that the, the Spirit and the love that He bears the, the fruit of, is it showing forth in your life? Or are you just like when they get ticky and you get ticky right back? And, and when they get haughty, you get haughty right back. What's, what's the response? 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse 8 through 11. Listen to the number of times that John uses this term love and their derivatives of the word agape or the actual word itself. Listen, he says in verse 8, he who does not love does not know God. He's not saying he who does not phileo, storge, or eros. He's saying he who does not agape does not know God. For God is love. So love is not what God does. Now, he manifests actions that show that he's love, but God is, it doesn't, is not doing love. God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We ought to love one another. All of these expressions, these words of a love that mean the words of love that mean agape. Now there's one word that's sitting right in the middle and it's that word propitiation. Propitiation, it's a legal term, and what it means is that forgiveness has been extended because a debt has been satisfied. Something's been paid, and so now forgiveness can be extended. Now, here's my question. We understand this, that Jesus says that no greater love has a man than this, that he would lay down his life for another. There's no greater love than that. That's the greatest expression of the agape, the self-sacrificing love. But let me tell you something. Many times we will never get to that point because we have unforgiveness in our hearts. What is that unforgiveness connected to? It's connected to the fact that people have done us wrong. People have mistreated us. People have abused us. People have violated us. People have slammed us. People have shamed us. People have thrown shade upon us, and we have a response to all of that that doesn't look like agape. Not at all. And so here's what we have to recognize, that before the Spirit can begin to bear the fruit of love in our lives, we have to deal with unforgiveness. So here's what I want you to do right now. I need you to ask yourself this question. Who do I need to forgive? You can really start right with your family members. Because the reality is, is the people who are going to get on your nerves the most, the place where you're going to have the greatest conflict is right there in your house. Oh, we just love everybody. It's us against the world. <laughs> well, I just need to know your secret. Because <laughs> there's conflict on occasion in my house. 
usually me creating the trouble with my mouth. Sid has to learn to walk in forgiveness quite often. All kidding aside, who do you need to forgive? I want you to just close your eyes right now, bow your head. I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to search the index of your heart. Go through the portals of your mind. Who do you need to forgive? Maybe it goes back years, decades. Maybe it goes back to just this morning. I don't know. But the only way we're going to get to this agape, this fruit of love that is born by the spirit in our hearts, is we have to let things go. But here's why we won't let things go is because we're thinking to ourselves, well, they did me wrong. And there needs to be some justice. See, we won't forgive because we're afraid that justice is not going to be served. See, I stood in that place. Drunk driver killed my first wife. And there came a point in time where I had to say to myself, do I want justice? Sure, I wanted justice. Sure, I wanted the guy to pay. Sure, I wanted him to be punished. But when I realized that, that there was issues going on in my heart and unforgiveness was surfacing, I realized this, man, I can't be his judge or his jury. So I turned him over to God. And when I turned him over to God, I literally said this, my hand's off this situation. I don't care if he doesn't, if, if he doesn't go to jail, that's fine with me. If he doesn't get charged for vehicular homicide, okay. That's between him and God. I let it go. I wash my hands of it. Who in the world do you need to wash your hands of right now? Oh, but pastor, you don't know what they did. It's, it's unbearable. It's unforgivable. Well, then what you've just done is you've now become God. And, and, the, and let me tell you what's really working in you that you can't forgive is you are too pride-filled. Pride-filled. So you're going to have to let it go. So we're going to do this right now. We're going to yield to the Spirit. I want you to say this. Say, Holy Spirit, I yield to you now. There are some things I have in my heart against people. And you know who the people are. I release them now to you. Holy Spirit, please bear within me the fruit of love right now. I let them go. I turn them over to you. I forgive them. And I release them. This is how we yield to the spirit. This is how the fruit begins to bear. Are the thoughts going to go away for the, the act against you? No, they won't. But every time it surfaces, you just say, I, I release that to God. Wash my hands of it. Yield to the spirit. Let's go to joy. Joy, the Greek word there is kara. And the Greek noun of this word describes a feeling of inner gladness, delight, or rejoicing. The root word of kara is kar, which means grace. Or it's a word we get charisma from, charismatic. It's a grace, an enabling ability of God. But here's what I want you to know about joy. Joy is not defined by the circumstance. Let me tell you where real joy comes from. Real joy comes when you begin to meditate and reflect on the fact that your sins are forgiven. That God is not mad with you anymore. That he is not angry. And there is this overwhelming sense of joy that comes upon you. That even in the middle of struggle, in the middle of pain, in the middle of testing, you find that you still have joy. Listen to what Jesus says. John 15, chapter, verse 9 as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. 
not based upon circumstances. Jesus is giving the disciples very bad news right now. And he's saying in the midst of these bad circumstances, there is this overwhelming inner uh, exhilaration, exuberance that can still overtake you in spite of the mess that's going on around you. So why do we need the spirit bearing the fruit of joy in our lives? Why? Because life happens. Life happens. We face trials. There are long, dark nights, and there are difficult days, and there are moments of weakness, and, and we have seasons of despair. But this is what James says, that when you encounter difficulty, he says this, count it all Count it all joy. Don't let the circumstances mess you up. Maybe you're in a bad situation, a situation you cannot control. But all you need to do is remember that God has established a relationship with you that you can run right into his presence and you can rejoice in that in spite of your circumstances. The psalmist said it like this. He knew trouble. He understood. And he says this. In Psalms 30, chapter, verse 4, it says, Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, it might be a long night. It might be a difficult night. It might be a long season or a difficult season. But at the end of the day, that because of what God has done for us, we can find joy in the midst of all of the struggle, in the midst of all of the trouble. Why? Because we know joy is on the way. Joy is coming. Listen to what Nehemiah said. He said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Can you say that? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Say it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. One more time. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You see, it's impossible to know true, soul-exhilarating, energizing, satisfying, fulfilling joy until you fully comprehend what God has done by giving his son. And I'm going to tell you that when you recognize your sins are forgiven you, shame is lifted off of you, condemnation is gone, there's no reason for you not to rejoice in every situation. He's lifted the burdens. He's removed the, the yoke. He's destroyed the, the vice grip of the enemy and, and sin in our lives. And for that, man, if we just take the time in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the test, and just reflect on this, God's got me, and I've got him. We're going to be all right. Let's talk about peace. The Greek word for peace there is arene, and the verb is uh, Ero, which means to join or bind together that which has been separated or divided. It's used, the same word we get from that is serenity. It's a peace. It, the context of that back in the day was it, it signified a country that had a great ruler and the ruler so cared for the people and was so efficient in the way they led that everybody was together. Everybody was unified. Everybody were going in the same page. There was a spirit of unity there. And in fact, in a little village, they would have the individual, the superintendent they called the superintendent. He was the keeper of the public peace. He was a, a unifying. And the Hebrew counterpart to this Greek word is shalom. So remember Paul in some of his letters, he would say this grace and peace. What he was doing was grace was the Greek salutation and peace was the Hebrew. And so what he was doing was he was bringing the two worlds together. The, the Jews with the Gentiles. Grace and peace. And this word shalom, when we begin to talk about peace, it's not just I'm... I'm wishing that nothing bad happens to you. It didn't just stop there, but it was, I'm hoping nothing bad happens to you and that everything good does. So it's an exponential blessing when the peace, the fruit of the Spirit is peace. So here's what we know about that. The peace is always connected to our relationship with God, to ourselves, and to others. That when the fruit of the Spirit, when we're yielding to him, the yielding produces the fruit of peace. So why do we need the Spirit bearing the fruit of peace in our lives? Because we are prone to worry. 
We're prone to worry. We, we concern ourselves about all kinds of things. We worry about our health. We worry about our finances. We worry about our children. We worry about our job. We worry about our career. We worry about our relationships. We worry about our money. But do you know why we worry? Do you know what's at the foundation, the crux of why we worry? is because we don't believe there is sufficient resource. We think that the resource is going to run out. We worry about our future because we just don't know what's going to happen in the future. So now we're worrying about it. When you all have to know this, that God's already been ahead in your future. And he says, I know the plans I have for you. They're good plans. So I can't see everything in the future, but I know the future's good. Because God said it's good. Why would we worry about our money? Well, it might run out. No, we have a God who says, I will supply all your need according to my riches, not according to yours. We worry about these relationships. What's going to happen here? And, and God's got all of this in control. But listen to what we do. What's our response to this worry? Philippians 4, verse 6 says this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God and the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Come on, I want you to stand to your feet, and I want you to just right now, in these next few moments, I just want you to say, Holy Spirit, I'm yielding to you. Let the fruit of love, let the fruit of joy, and let the fruit of peace begin to manifest itself in me. Hallelujah. So what's the application? This week, as I said to you on last week, walk in the Spirit, yeah. completely submitting yourself under His control. Walk in the Spirit. Submit yourself under His control. Number one, let your love be active. Let your love be active towards God and, and towards yourself. Come on, give yourself a break. God has given you a break. Give yourself a break. Love God. Love yourself. Love others. Manifest the agape love. The second thing is let the joy of the Lord be your strength. No matter what's going on around you, you're saved. And at the end of the day, it's all good. And everybody, can you say that? It's all good. It's all good. Because the king's got you. You're going to be fine. You're going to overcome. You're going to pass the test. It's all good. And then the third thing, let the peace of God rule in your heart and in your mind. Just let his peace come. So when we encounter difficult people and we encounter difficult trials and we encounter difficult circumstances and we want to worry, here's what we just simply say. is Holy Spirit, I yield. That's what we do. And the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace, flood our soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and we thank you for how great you are. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Holy Spirit, thank you that this week you empower your people to cause them to walk out this fruitful life that you intended for them. And we thank you.